Well, thank you so much. That was a sort of super thought-provoking uh, lecture. And um, as a host for this evening, I will exercise my host privilege and ask the first uh, question. Um, assuming you get a die, a practical die method of producing electricity, I was trying to sort of think, would, would this sort of be very, very local, that you sort of do it for specific purposes, like you'd, you'd have a sort of cell that would boil a kettle? Would you, would you sort of envisage sort of large centralised power stations. I couldn't quite see how would how you get the delivery of the electricity to where you wanted to use it. I, I mean, at, at the moment, when people put um, solar panels on the roofs and it just gets fed into the, uh, the grid, you could imagine doing that. Or you could imagine... Um, I mean, putting it on roofs is a sensible thing to do because it doesn't disrupt anybody's view or you can make you can now make uh, roof tiles that you can do that and, and so I think it will come to that so that's what you can do on a domestic level but I think for countries such as um, you know large parts of Africa are, are, are where the population don't have electricity um, and large parts of that land we could do that but then we'd have to give it to the engineers to be able to transmit that electricity efficiently because of course at the moment um, with our uh, energy transmission, we lose a lot of energy just simply putting it down the power line. So we'll have to solve that as well. You know, there's lots and lots of different problems. So I see there's some young people in the audience. So there's lots of things for you to be doing. You know, <laughs> here a chemist, I'm breaking bonds, but as an engineer, you can get more efficient transmission. So you know, the, the, there's lots of things still to be done. Um, and there's how wonderful is that? Okay, question over there. Well, thank you very much indeed. As an electrical engineer, for me, that 11% efficiency actually sounds pretty reasonable. It is. So, um, <laughs> what, what's your goal? What, 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 what is going to be the good efficiency uh, you need out of your die to actually really make a difference? And what's going to characterise yeah. it? How will you get your eureka moments? I mean, how will you yeah. know you're there? Of course, the 11% is uh, under ideal conditions in a lab. Okay, we know as soon as we manufacture and take it out into the great uh, world out there, it, the efficiency drops off. So we're looking at over 20% before we can, you know, before it becomes economically uh, sensible to, to be doing that. So that's the goal, is to get it up around there. Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me was your um, use of platinum group metals yep. uh, all the way through, yep. whether it's as the um, electrode or in the complexes yep. themselves. Those are, of course, um, expensive, yep. difficult to produce, yep. limited supply. Yep. So do they, is that a limitation of doing this yep. at scale? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, if you look at... Um, the abundance of the elements and remember for everything we do for everything we are we only have the um, elements that are available in the periodic table we have to be clever and, and, and combine them but we only have that choice but of all the elements in the periodic table and there's over a hundred now um, but there's only about 12 of them that are in such huge supply that we can you know the, the, and that's really what we should be looking at so if I was to choose a metal then it would have to be iron but iron has um, real problems here for the energetics are difficult for iron so we, uh, there's been some very interesting work done uh, recently to move uh, away both in terms of doing um, organic polymer type, organic molecules, to, that in other words don't have a metal in them at all. Um, and then there's been a lot of work just done recently on perovskites that use the more abundant, that you can put more abundant metals in. So yes, uh, but I think that's true of many things we do. If we can get the technology right and we understand it, then we can look to see how to adapt it using materials that are very plentiful. But you're quite right to point that out. No, there's not an infinite, that, I mean, ruthenium, um, platinum, etc. they're expensive and there's not that much of them. Um, so I was just going to say, from um, in a sort of, okay, um, in a sort of global context yeah. with oil prices, yeah. you know, around the 80s and things like that, do you think the investment there is really feasible from an energy perspective to sort of um, to make the production of solar energy, 
you know, across the globe are actually viable thing? Or do you think, you know, do you, do you have any sort of idea of what their sort of context of the world needs to be for solar energy to really take charge? Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, I think as, as an economist, you would say, why bother? We, we're fine with the oil at the moment, thanks very much. But I think uh, I feel a certain responsibility that I would like generations to come to have a planet that's worth living in. So I think there's that argument. But I mean, I think if you look at some countries that don't have a supply of oil, that, so they, in other words, they have to ship in all their oil, gas, or coal, then in, in the, um, for them, actually the price of renewables such as solar is almost reaching the same cost as uh, the uh, non-renewable energy sources. So I, I don't think that economically, I think it, it could happen and could happen quite quickly. But that's where I come back to things like fracking have made the, uh, have tipped it slightly more back in favour of let's just use the oil and gas that we've got because we've, we've found more of it, you know, instead of thinking, well, perhaps we should still be continuing with the uh, research into to renewables and going for the better energy mix. Uh, thanks. Um, I remember when I was a child, like, I'm just not, yesterday. not that old, no. but, um, <laughs> you know, I remember, you know, it was 30 years ago, we saw on TV where they had solar panel powered cars. Mm, mm. You know, they're flimsy things covered like massive yeah. solar and they drive them in the desert. But do you think that solar pa energy ever has the potential to get where we can have practical solar panel powered cars or buses? Yes, I do think so, but I think we will need to make sure that there's, a, there's the battery technology, because it'll probably be battery technology that goes along with it, the battery technology, and, and there's a whole other area of research that needs done, uh, the uh, battery technology keeps up with, uh, you know, it has to go hand in hand with that, because um, what happens if, you know, you're wanting to get from A to B in the middle of the night, then we need to be... Yeah, like, more like, but like with hybrid cars, that, I mean, that could be solved quite easily. So, but, in, but with the, do you, do, you, do you actually see that the panel's getting that powerful? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah, I do, I do think that'll happen. Um, and I think it'll happen. I think it could happen relatively quickly. That'll be good. Please. When solar panels become sufficiently high efficiency to be economically viable, and they do become widespread. Mm. How do you envisage the um, energy spread depending on climate variation? So, for example, it being a sunny day or a cloudy day, how do you imagine the energy being shared amongst the individual, say, people with houses, having them on their roofs, or even large-scale uh, factories, almost, of power? How do you imagine it will be spread when there's uneven... Uh, environmental distribution. Yeah, no, uh, that's, why th um, uh, that's why I firmly believe it'll have to be an energy mix. That's why I think that we can't just rely on one source unless you have terrific storage and you've sorted it all out. Um, but, you know, the usual problem of, what was it, half time in the football match, everybody wants a cup of tea or whatever it is, you know, and you, you suddenly need to, so you need to have something that has that base load. So am I against nuclear energy? No, I'm not, because it does help us um, give the base load there. So I think we have to look to see how we can have the mix, because we all want electricity on tap or, or the, the, the flick of a button. We all want it. And if that's what we want, then we're going to have to look to see how we can best supply that need. If everybody was to turn around and say, no, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just have a cup of tea when the sun's shining, then, then that's fine. But that's not going to happen, is it? So I think we have to be sensible and pragmatic and look to see how best it is we can come up with solutions that will satisfy everybody without depleting too, uh, significant amounts of the resource that's present in the planet at the moment. OK. Um, please. Uh, we're not famed for sunlight in this country, no. and, yet, and yet plants manage to do very well. Absolutely. Um, 
is it possible to tailor the spectral properties of your dyes so they can take energy from, say, infrared or near infrared, that sort of range? Because that might be rather good for this country, whereas... Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you make a very good point. And, and, and what people do is, is talk about having uh, a range of dyes present so that you can get, you can capture as much of the energy from the sun as you possibly can. So absolutely, that's perfectly, a perfectly good point to, to, to make. Um, yeah. Please. Hi. Um, with some of the semiconductor um, photovoltaic cells, you can use multiple junctions in order mm -hmm. to uh, extract different band gap energies. Mm -hmm. um, is there a fundamental um, efficiency limit on, on the dye-based cells? No, because um, what you do is you tune the, uh, the gap by changing the, the nature and the position of your, your other groups around on the dye to be able to tune that gap. So just as I was saying to this gentleman here, you can, you can uh, then consider having whole series of them with different groups around it and put mm -hmm. them all together so that they absorb all the energy. So, so, so potentially you could have a mixture of dyes yeah, absolutely. Uh, in one cell yeah. to capture yeah. the whole range. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then one last question here. Um, I was wondering, seeing as, as you were saying it isn't actually that sunny in the UK, um, would it be be would you say that it would be better sort of in the future to have big plants in somewhere where it is very sunny, such as Africa, and then use something like a s try to use superconductors or something to take it across, mm -hmm. or have something in the UK where you're going to get less energy coming down, but you'll lose less in transmission, which... No, I think that, that, that you're, you're perfectly right. Uh, and that's why I think, um, in, uh, I mean, you can get, you can generate enough electricity um, from solar power in Scotland from on, or with your panels on your roof to power your house. You can do that easily, okay? There is, there is enough energy in the sun to do that. Um, but I think in, in places like uh, Scotland, as I said, I think we'll probably end up having um, a lot more wind and tide power. Uh, so I think you're right. I think you look to see where, where the form of renewable energy that best suits where you are and you generate it there and we then give it to the engineers to be able to transmit it properly, you know, and efficiently. Um, and that's the way that we'll get electricity to everybody.